Welcome, everybody, to the Freud Museum in London. Welcome to this event with Michael Rosen, Professor Michael Rosen. Uh, the event's called in Michael Rosen in Discussion, A Dream of COVID and Recovery, which will be discussing with Michael his wonderful book, Many Different Kinds of Love, A Story of Life, Death and the NHS. We're here at the Freud Museum London, which has recently reopened after the pandemic. This was Freud's home. It was his last home during the years 1938 to 1939. It has the original couch from Vienna and his belongings, which were thankfully transported from Vienna at the time. Uh, during this event, please do interact uh, with us, with, with Michael, uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom. That, that would be great if you, if you could do that. Um, so welcome to everybody, and welcome particularly to Michael Rosen, who's, who's here. He's one of Britain's best-loved writers and performance poets for children and adults. Uh, he first started training to be a medic, but then switched to English literature at Wadham College, Oxford, went on to study for an MA at Reading, PhD in North London. He's currently Professor of Children's Literature at Goldsmiths, University of London, which is a, a wonderful institution and a very, very terrific place. Um, and he's taught on MA courses in university since 1994. He was the UK's Children's Laureate from 2007 to 2009. He's published over 200 books for children and adults. And he has one of the most positive and compassionate and sensible Twitter feeds that you could imagine, <laughs> which have everything from politics, uh, excoriating the people who need to be excoriated <laughs> all the way down to, to domestic issues and relationships with the, the neighbor's cat and uh, all, the, all this type of thing. And, and um, Michael also has a new book out, Sticky McSixick, which details um, his stick through which he learned to walk again, which is also partly related in his uh, book, Many Different Kinds of Love, but he's gone into much detail with it in uh, his latest book. So, so Michael, welcome. welcome. It's thanks. great to have you here. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks for asking me. Well, yes. Thank you. Um, so, so my name is Mark Lager, and I'm a professor of psychology at Swansea University, where I research sleep and dreaming and the relationship of dreams to uh, waking life. I work with the artist Julia Lockhart, who's in the background here, because we work together so that when I discuss dreams with people, she paints the dream. And so she, in a way, socializes the dream, brings it out to the real world so that it can be revisited again and again in family and friends. We know that with Michael, he's written about his dreams and he's written about his dreams in his book, which is more obviously than most people do. And so the dreams are already out there, but we do appreciate and like turning them back to a visual scene again, even though it's Julia Lockhart's um, interpretation of that scene. Uh, Julia and I worked over the pandemic discussing the dreams of healthcare workers and key workers online, and the dreams would be painted at the same time. And so some of those paintings are now here at the Freud Museum. And during the pandemic, we started, uh, during this year, we started reading Michael's book, and we were fascinated by the book. The book is very touching. The book is very funny in very many places. It's irreverently funny in, in very many parts of it, you know, with, with bathos, in, in fact, in the way that you are just suddenly brought down to something that's, that's just funny uh, as a result of these terrible circumstances that so many people, including Michael, uh, were in. But we noticed also that there were several dreams in the book, and so that intrigued us even more. And so we were really wanting to try to have an event in which we could discuss one of Michael's dreams with him. So that's what this event uh, is about, as well as about discussing a dream. And so the first thing we were going to do is just ask Michael how he is at the moment, because many people over the pandemic will have followed the Twitter messages and other uh, messages in the media about how Michael was and were very, very worried for him. We know his family were obviously very worried. 
but so would people around the world. And so we just wanted to start the event off by asking Michael how he is now. Well, uh, never ask someone how they are. <laughs> they might tell you. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, I've lost most of the sight from my left eye, most of the hearing from my left ear. I have numb toes. Um, I have um, apparently digested the blood clots that were in my pulmonary artery, or technically in the saddle of the two pulmonary arteries. I'm gesturing vaguely towards them like I'm an anatomical expert. Um, and I get dizzy uh, quite often. Um, but I've learned to, like this, blow out my eustachian tubes, which I can demonstrate. There we go. That tends to oh, stop me being dizzy. Um, but I do get vertigo every now and then, uh, sometimes when I'm lying down, which is quite disturbing. Um, and I think I'm weak. Um, so some days I'm sort of full of go, full of zip, uh, can walk up hills and things. And then the next day, pretty well exhausted. I had a sort of bad week this week, as it happens, two or three days just sort of like sitting on the sofa, really, which I mean, actually, it's, 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 you know, can't object to, really. Um, there were things, things I thought I ought to do, and then I thought, well, maybe I don't, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just sit here until it gets better. better. So, so I did. Well, you're looking fit and well, and that's great. And, and just to let people know, I mean, Michael's obviously just come upstairs because we're up the first floor of the Freud Museum. Um, and this is the floor where there's often exhibitions going on. We're just above the room, which was Freud's bedroom, which has the couch in it. But Michael's come up the stairs here. We've got the Freud's garden just behind us outside the, the windows um, as well. Um, so we, we love the book, but we wondered, would, would you like to say how the book came to be written? Yes. Um, so the book tells the story of how I got ill. Um, and then it goes silent from me because uh, I was put in an induced coma. Uh, I think technically you're supposed to say sedated, but anyway, uh, induced coma meant I was knocked out with drugs for 40 days, which sounds very biblical, doesn't it? Mm. 40 mm. days mm. and 40 mm. nights, you know, was mm. I in the desert or was I, where was I? Babylon, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, so I was out of it for 40 days. And then there is a rather strange period which I think lasts for about 10 days, possibly more, where I'm, everybody thinks I'm awake, apart from me now looking back at it, because I have no memory. So there's the totally unconscious period. Then there's another period where people said, you're awake and I talked, but I've got no memory of it. Hmm. And then there's the next phase over the next two or three months where I'm sort of think I'm fine and so on. And in that era, when I came out of hospital, that's after three months, after rehabilitation, where I needed to write things down. I see. So right. I always think of the blank page as a friend, because you can say anything to it, it doesn't answer you back, you can be rude mm. to it, mm. you can confide in it. And so I started off just by jotting, look at my gesture, I'm just jotting words. And then when I run out of steam, I start a new line and jot some more words. And when I do, mm. and then things start sticking together. And so a set of poems emerged and I sent them away and um, the publisher got interested. And then I said there were the nurse's letters and there were my wife Emma's emails to the family saying what I was mm. doing. And suddenly it got a three dimensional aspect. So instead of it just being me kvetching, as you'd say in Yiddish, which means mm. complaining. Yes. So instead of it's just me kvetching that my leg hurts, it's actually got nurses talking to me through the nurse's diary they wrote, which is, mm. some people have said, well, that's the really interesting bit of the book. You know, we can leave your poems out of it, Mike, actually. <laughs> Friends, you know. Um, <laughs> and it is, it is incredible because these are people working 12 hour shifts, you know, under the most terrible conditions. My ward, 42% of us were dying. Mm. There were some of the nurses it weren't trained. They were a speech therapists and so on coming in mm. and, you know, one moment you're caring for somebody and hoping that they'll survive and then they literally die mm. in your hands sort of yes. thing. And they're willing me to live. And it's so, yes. I read it and it's, you know, I can hardly bear to because they, they've got more interest in me living than I have. Mm. Yes. You know, in terms of yes. me reading the narrative, I'm just thinking, you know, I've mm. given up. Mm. And, you know, I'm nearly dead. So, you know, I've got, I can't do anything about it anyway, can I? Mm. And... And so it's so powerful. And Emma, 
you know, she's writing to the family and she's sort of trying to soften the blow a bit. She's sort of saying, he's coming on, you know. Mm. And so I sort of read that and it, it's, I sort of think of her sitting there, you know, waiting for the phone to ring, not knowing what the phone would be, then nobody does ring. So she rings the hospital mm. and says, and they go, yeah, he's doing okay, sort of thing. And then she relays that. And um, it's very, very powerful because it's sort of all these people sort of willing me to live. Mm. And I'm just lying there, you know, I've seen film of me and I, I am, you know, cadaverous. I look like a corpse. I'm very, very white and tubes, tracheostomy, you know, yes. and I don't, when I sleep, I don't sleep with my eyes closed. Mm. So I, it's, all, it's all white to white. I'm sort of zombie, you know, yes. and um, it's sort of such a contrast between my kind of inertness and their care and concern. So all that's in yes. the book. <laughs> yes, I, I, I can imagine that you, you'd, having realised all of that, because of course you were, you were in a coma or, or asleep for a lot of it, realising and then that, that is a good thing to put out there and you would want to put out the care that have, has mm. happened from so many people. And that's why it's about yes. the health service as well mm. as me. So, it's, I mean, I quite like that. So if it's, it, it's not me saying, aren't they great? And it is me saying that. I do say that, you know, I think about them. I think about them as kind of, in the end, I can't find a metaphor to describe it. So I end up thinking of them as my parents. Mm, yes, One of the words I use is that it, it, the only people I know who care for people like that was like when my own kids were ill and you give them some paracetamol and you sing them a song and you hold their hand. Yes. Well, why do you do that? It, well, because you're a parent and the, and the nurses were doing that to me. Yes. They were holding my hand, singing me happy birthday. My birthday was halfway through the coma. Yes. Thought, why did they do, you know, you don't need to, there's this slab of meat sitting there with a tube in him. Why, why do you sing, sing him happy birthday? Well, that's yes. the humanness of it, isn't it? It's yes. incredible. Yes. Yes. And um, it's, yeah, so to put that in, it's, you know, it's uh, showing rather than telling, you know, it's that old story of, uh, we always talk about it in radio. We say, do you show it or do you tell it? Mm. And if you can show it, it's always more powerful than if you tell it. Yes. it, it, it you, you allow the person to speak. You know? Yes, I see. Yes. No, that was fascinating, that bit in the book where you talk about them. It's very poetic. The the staff and others who are cared for you are, are, are parents, are like parents. That was a very poetic part in, in a book which is full of uh, poems. It's, the whole thing is, a, is, a, is poetry. So that, that has been wonderful. And, and how has the book been? I mean, we've loved it, but how, how has the book been received or, or what feedback um, have you it's had? It's been amazing, mostly. Um, uh, yes, 99% has been very, very moved, seem to be moved by it. People write to me and say that, um, you know, sometimes they're moved to tears, other times they fell about laughing. Mm. Um, mm. So that's been very nice. Um, and mm. people have been desperate to get hold of it. It's my first bestseller right. in, in terms of it being in the charts for a couple of weeks, which was rather lovely. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of social work we've got to mm. do to understand what's happened to us. Mm. And there's a, pers there's a level of personal trauma that people have experienced either being ill or being looking after someone who's ill or people have died. So there's bereavement. And then there's a kind of social trauma, societal trauma mm. that you can't quite put, we can't quite put our fingers on. I don't think I can fully that I see it expressed in anger and division mm. when people, you know, I saw somebody describe the way I talked about COVID as being a nasty old man. And I thought, well, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, from coming where this person was coming from, namely somebody who didn't really believe it, that COVID existed mm. and that it was a scandemic or whatever they call mm. it, a spam, I don't know, anyway, that it was all a trick. Well, then I emerge out of that as a nasty old man because I'm going on about COVID. And so mm. that seems to me to express what's a societal trauma, really, because it's meaning that we haven't yet found, or, we, or maybe we never will, a communal way to describe this. So those of us who believe in it, had it, and the doctors and nurses who've dealt with it, we're all talking about it one way. And there's another group of people who just think that it's all been a hoax. I mean, mm. I was in a cab the other day and a guy was 83 and he said, I've never, I've never known anybody who got it. I said, well, you know me now. Mm. He said, yeah, no, I mean, no, though. 
Wow. And I thought, well, isn't that, wow. you know, and, it, and I could hear straight away he was resisting. He, did, he didn't want to, as he happens, he was picking me up from the hospital after an eye checkup, but he didn't want to know. Yes. I mean, some cabbies, they go, what happened? Mm -hmm. You know, and they immediately want me to kind of relate it, warts and all. Mm -hmm. And they keep going, more, more, tell mm -hmm. me more. It's a sort mm -hmm. of, I mean, you could, you know, it's a bit vicarious, but it doesn't matter. You know, we, we all like a bit of disaster gossip. So, um, it, but it, I could hear from this chap, but I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And I thought, you know, me and you, there's a great gulf between us. Yes. And that's part of this societal trauma, I think. Yes. No, that's very, very true. And we're very grateful that you've written the book because it, it tells what happened. It tells what's happened with COVID, what COVID really does to people and what the necessities of the healthcare service are to have to treat those vast numbers of people having that. Yeah, well, my dad, I remember, who taught literature, there's a Robert Browning poem that I can't quote exactly, but one bit of it is from somebody bringing the news from Aix to Ghent. I haven't pronounced those in the French and Belgian way, but Aix to Ghent, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's Aix to Ghent in the poem. And um, my dad used to say that one of the roles of writing, but of course it applies across journalism, uh, is to take the news from somewhere to somewhere else. So writers witness things, experience things, mm. and they bring us the news. So if you are a writer, you sometimes feel it either as an urge, mm. almost like mm. you're, I'd sometimes describe it to children as a scratching an itch. Mm. You get an itch that you want to mm. write about it, but also occasionally like a mission. This has happened to me, it's extraordinary, or it's happened to somebody I know about. You know, I've sort of dug into my family, what happened to my relatives and so on mm -hmm. during the war. And so I sort mm -hmm. of feel sometimes I get the itch to bring the news from Aix to Ghent. Mm -hmm. You know, again, as part of that societal trauma thing, I've seen some people saying that people like me, we appear on television talking about this stuff and we're benefiting from mm -hmm. having been ill. Mm -hmm. yes. So it, and I can sort of, you know, from the outside, if you don't believe in this stuff, you'd look at somebody like that, this nasty old man talking about, being ill sort of thing and that, that somehow you, you know it's a sort of uh yeah somebody wrote a thing about how c-list celebrities have done so well right. out of covid and there's a the guy who was the wonderful biographer of the beatles ray Connolly. he got he got ill at the same time as me and was in coma for about the same time and we were in this c-list celebrities mm. kind of category mm. of having mm. you know benefited so enormously from having nearly died yes. Um, oh dear. And uh, no, no, I, I, yes. I mean, I can see it. I can see that this is part of the, the of the trauma. But you, I just think, from the point of view of a writer, there is a sense that you're bringing the news. That's sort mm. of what I felt as I was writing. Well, this is what it feels like today. Yes. When I went to see the optician or the, the ophthalmologist, that's what it was like today. Yes. So there's some of that. It's sort of pinning yes. down and bringing the news. Yes. Oh, that's that's fantastic yes well you have brought the news about what was going on at the time and what was going on physically to you to your family to the healthcare workers and others and you you've brought that out you've also brought out which, which several other people did in research studies but people are now doing in literature and, and you have done is that COVID also affected people's dreams as well. And people, there, there was evidence people are dreaming more, sharing dreams more, and pe dreams are affected. And so we're very grateful that as well as bringing all that news out, you had the news from you know, your own sleep of how you were being affected. Um, there, there were some amazing ones. There's one of, of a dream of a desert in which you're warned that the desert is deadly and you've got to go round it, which thankfully in real life you did. So that was quite an amazing metaphor. And I thought um, of it as, as like those two explorers. Yes. I'm not going to remember their names, but I always think of them as Burke and Hare, but they're not. That's, that was the bodies. Yes. Um, but the two guys who yes, walked across Australia and didn't survive. Yes, didn't survive. Yes. So if you went, so it was a very metaphorical dream like that is really quite amazing of skirting round death who's after you. Um, and there's the other dream, which was the, the one that we were really captivated by which was the one about Land's End. And so we're wondering if you would kindly read of that course. dream. We're going to ask uh, Michael to read the dream twice, just to make sure uh, many people have read this, they'll know it, but it's just so that we get the dream in our minds as well. It's also being read twice so that Julia Lockhart, who's here, can hear the dream. Julia is going to start flicking through, Julia's going to paint it, but she's going to start flicking through the pages of Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams. 
She's doing that because after Michael has read the book, we're just going to ask Michael what was happening at the time, what was going on in his life. We know lots about what was, but it would just be good to know that. And Freud also got people to say, where, where did the particular parts of the dream come from? We're, we're not interested in anything more than, it, than that, than working out where the dream was situated in your life at the time. This isn't psychotherapy or anything like that. It's just trying to appreciate the dream by, first of all, hearing it in detail, and then hearing about Michael's life circumstances and experience of the pandemic at, at the time. So after Michael has read it a couple of times, what we need to do is just make sure we've got a full account as, as possible. There, there may be some questions about it. Of now, course. it may not be possible for, for you to remember. You may have the whole thing down there. The reason I've got my phone here is so that the Q&A function can work. So this is here so that people who are in this event can type in questions. And so what we'll invite, first of all, is just questions about the dream, because we want to make sure that, although it's recorded in the book, we have as full account of it as possible, that Julia hears that full account. And then while the discussion is ongoing, Julia in the background will be painting the dream and we'll all, with you, be discussing it. So I'd invite Michael to... Very good. A couple of footnotes by way of a beginning. Uh, just for those of you who don't live in Britain, um, Land's End is the southwest tip of England, and it's a very, very rocky place. If ever you go there, it really does feel like the end of the earth. You may know in France they have Finisterre, which means the same thing. So it does mean the kind of end of the land, and it sort of ends in a little triangle, so that you'll hear that. And Emma is the name of my wife. So here it goes. We were at Land's End. We climbed over a stone wall. On the other side, I noticed that we were at the top of a cliff, sheer drop, hundreds of feet down. I said that I wanted to go back over the wall, but I noticed a big hole in the wall. I squeezed into it so that I could get through, but got stuck. I shouted to you, push, Emma, push. You did, but I couldn't get through. Then I noticed that there were people walking around. It was a space like a ruined church made suitable for visitors with surfaced walkways. I called out to someone, can you pull me through? He tried, but he couldn't. I felt so helpless and I was worried about you at the top of that cliff. You were still pushing. Then I called out to another person in the ruined church. He got hold of me and pulled me through. And I'll do that again. Thank you. We were at Land's End. We climbed over a stone wall. On the other side, I noticed that we were at the top of a cliff, sheer drop, hundreds of feet down. I said that I wanted to go back over the wall, but I noticed a big hole in the wall. I squeezed into it so that I could get through, but got stuck. I shouted to you, Push, Emma, push. You did, but I couldn't get through. Then I noticed that there were people walking around. It was a space like a ruined church made suitable for visitors with surfaced walkways. I called out to someone, can you pull me through? He tried, but he couldn't. I felt so helpless and I was worried about you at the top of that cliff. You were still pushing. Then I called out to another person in the ruined church. He got hold of me and pulled me through. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for thank that. You. So that, that's from the part of Michael's book with recovery part two. So this is in the second stage of uh, the recovery. Um, now, we've got one question in already. Did you know any of the people who were walking around? Uh, were they, for example, nurses and doctors, or were they just people walking around in the church? Uh, random people, but the church was, uh, I had transposed from, um, some people will know this, it's um, Lindisfarne in, in the northeast of England. Mm. Um, it's rather magical because it produced this incredible doc thing called the Lindisfarne Gospels, but all there is is a kind of ruined church. So on the one hand, it's sort of 
bits of a ruined church and these walkways exactly as I described them. But it's, if you want to fill your mind, it's got this wonderful, incredible, ornate document that you can find. Um, I'm not sure where it is now. Uh, mm. I think it may be in the British Library, but anyway, a copy of it is. And um, so it's, it's sort of imbued with meaning, the place, because it was this place where incredible workmanship and mm. beauty took place in writing down um, what was an old English version of the Bible. So uh, that was the place that I transposed into mm. the dream. So it's ironically, it's one end of England to the other, Land's End and Lindisfarne. So these are about as far apart you can get in it within England, not Scotland and Wales, but within England. Yeah. Right. And Lindisfarne, for the people on the call from outside uh, the UK, Lindisfarne is in the north east yep, of northeast. England on yep. the coast. Cornwall is the bit that juts out into the Atlantic. So they're both very coastal, uh, rocky. Yeah places and so in answer to to this question that you don't really know the people walking around they're just random people no but I've situ it's quite interesting isn't it I don't know the people but I've got the geography is very clear in my mind so it's a kind of topographical dream rather than a personal one apart from Emma who's you know busy trying to get me through the wall yeah right okay thank you and the the actual scenery of the of the area there in Land's End uh, it's not really trees, is it? It's, it's no, green no. grass and it's rocky. It's granite rocky. and it's it's also, you've got these great cliffs, various points in Cornwall. It's, it's, quite, it's quite scary because there's like a coastal walk and it's quite dangerous um, and it's high up. So you can have that sense of, you know, crashing waves 100, 200, 300 feet below. Um, and even, you know, towards Land's End, even if not at Land's End itself. Uh, you've got that. They're, they're dangerous places uh, in that mm. part of, of, of England. And Lindisfarne, just one other thing, I think it was sacked by the Vikings. That was another little bit of English history. That So that church, the reason why it's kind of raised is the idea that the Vikings arrived and sacked it. It's probably a bit of romantic history, but that's that's the story anyway. Right. So the church, it doesn't really have a roof. It's got bits no. of walls, but that's about Yes, about that's it. right. It's bits of arch that are left there and you walk about them and it's got a slightly ghostly air about it. If, I mean, you'll find it on, uh, on on images, Google images, um, and it's got a slightly ghostly air. And you can, if you're there at the end of the day, or if, yeah, the, the light in it can be quite quite odd, really, because it's, it's on, I say, it's on the East Coast. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yes. I mean, arches and other things That's like right. that in, the, in this sort of old building. And so what was the weather like? All this. Um, yeah, I can remember that. It was, uh, yeah, it was real English weather, as we say. It was grey and slightly drizzly. That's right. I can remember. <laughs> I can remember that quite clearly. So it wasn't. You can get beautiful sunny weather both on the east coast and on, in Cornwall, but obviously, my dream decided to make it quite drizzly. Yeah, that's right. It's grey and drizzly. Grizzly and Dre, the, yeah. Ray, the, um, yeah. uh, the the scenery there, right? Yes, and the people who were walking around were they were they therefore dressed in coloured clothes, or there's no you know anorak type things, or or there's yeah, not they're, really a they're memory of classic that. kind of holiday makery English British people, as you say. We tend to walk around in kind of slightly drab anoraks. We don't kind of mm. go for for bright colours, and um, also they're largely indifferent to me until I call out. So they're walking about with their guides and looking at the ruined arches. And um, that's why I have to call out to them. Um, and perhaps I haven't quite expressed that I'm sort of a bit desperate that they are ignoring me because I'm stuck around my waist in the in mm. the wall. Mm. Um, and so I, I'm calling out quite desperately for them. Yes, yes so perhaps I've missed that bit out. Yeah, I am in it. Not, I'm not panicking, but I am urgent. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> now you did say, well, you said you called out to one person, but we've had a question in about how tall was the wall? Uh, those dry stone walls that you get in the north of England, they're usually mostly between three and five feet. So, uh, or do that in meters, but between one and two meters. Mm. So they're not that high. But they're incredibly, I mean, it's kind of magic because they I say dry stone wall, they're, they're built without cement or mortar, but they stay up because of the brilliance in which the shepherds and the local people, it's a classic mm. case of vernacular building, that mm. they wedge the stones into each other and build these stone walls. 
and, and some of them after many years, you know, they do break down stuff. So obviously I've found a weak spot in, my, <laughs> in one of the walls, but I've, it's not big enough for me to get through. Right, thank you. Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> and so Emma is with you on the, the cliff side of the wall. Yes. What was Emma? Do you remember what Emma was wearing? Emma, your wife, just so yes. clear. Yes. Um, no, I, I can't see what Emma is wearing. I know she's there. And I had the idea that we were both going to go through the wall. That was the idea. Hmm. And she had, I think she had, maybe I decided to go first or she suggested, I don't know where the dream begins. But so I think the idea was she was going to push me through and then she's smaller than me. And so she would be able to get through. Yes. Um, so I'm asking her to sort of shove my backside right. to get me through because I'm sort of trapped around the sort of waist yes. above the hip, you see. Um, yeah. Right. OK, thank you. But I need obviously need more of a pull, don't I, from the other side. You know that thing when you get the sofa stuck in the door and then you you can't push it anymore, so you send someone round to go the other mm. side and pull and push. So it needed the pull as well as the push. Yes, yeah. right. And thankfully, you get one man the other side who does pull you through after another man who doesn't manage to do so. And do you remember what they were wearing, or were they just average sort of bad weather English clothing? I think it's more of the same. Yeah, I think we're talking anoraks, cagoules, as they're sometimes called. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. We're in Anorak Kagul territory. Um, classic sort of English summer holiday. Um, my parents were very keen on camping when I was a kid. And, you know, the best hmm. holidays, as far as they were concerned, were the ones where it rained all the time because you could prove your mettle. Hmm. You know what I mean? There yes. was this sort of idea that, you know, they seemed to sort of seek out those parts of England that were the wettest yes. for these camping holidays. Yes. And, um, so I got a sense of this kind of, yes, dull, anoraki, cagoul fraternity. Yes. <laughs> right. yes. We've had one question in. Uh, are there children among the people there? No. Mm. No, which is quite odd for me because obviously I've, I've got children. I've got quite a few. Mm. And um, also... Uh, you know, people on holiday, you, but I've, I've sort of denuded it of children, which is a bit, a bit sad, really. Um, you know, I, I tell, I describe myself as one of the longest running school parents around because my oldest is uh, 45 and my youngest is 16. So I've been a school parent sort of mm. nonstop in that time. So mm. I sort of have a sense of being surrounded by children in all that time. So, uh, yes. And, um, yeah, no, the dream, no, I'm, yes, I'm being honest here as I can. There's, there's, there's no children that I can see, neither ours, which is a bit sad. What have we done with them? Mm. Um, uh, or anybody else's? Yes. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and somebody else has written in to say, did you see any faces or were the people faceless? Largely faceless, yeah. I can't really see faces. There's nobody I'm distinguishing. There's nobody that I distinguished within the dream. I know Emma's there. I'm thank because I'm stuck in the wall. I can't see Emma either. So I, I know she's there, but I can't see her. So, um, yes, it's, um, I mean, there's a, a sense of disembodiment. And of course, you know, from what you know of me and where I was then, it, it relates very closely to the idea I'm stuck mm -hmm. in bed um, and I can't see Emma. And also there's some doubt really as to whether I could see the people around me. When I look at the film of me in the hospital, quite clearly I'm not seeing with my left eye, but at one point a doctor comes up to me and he starts talking to me and I'm going like this, I'm sort of scanning his face. Mm. So the sensation of not being able to distinguish and see people, that that was there from my real situation and also of course i'm stuck i'm in a bed i've got a ventilator down my throat i've got mm. a tracheostomy mm. i've got um, a drips in there and i mustn't move they also gave me one of these uh nasogastric things so I stuck up my nose as well so and i'm warned all the time that i mustn't move because i could knock something out and in fact as i 
was emerging, they made me wear mittens. And it's one of my first recollections of the whole thing once I'd been knocked out. So that's probably about day 50. And I'm trying to get the mittens off. So that's almost my very first memory of that. So a sense of kind of constriction and helplessness. And the nurse saying to me, lie still, relax, save your energy. Mm. And yes, I, 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 I just, yes. I just remember this sort of sense of trappedness and the nurse saying, save your energy. And I said, I think I said at one point, what, what am I saving my energy for? And I could see she had no idea what I was talking about. It was just this rather stroppy old bloke sitting in bed going, what am I saving my energy for? Right. Yes. And she just gently moved away, thought, hmm, yes. Right. Won't deal with that one now. Right. So rather indistinct faces in the dream, just yes. as in real life, your waking life, your, your, your faces, are, faces are rather indistinct, in, in, um, not really clear yeah. either. Um, the sea, although it's grey and a drizzly day, what's the sea like? Um, the sea has got that um, slightly dangerous look that um, the water has uh, around those coasts, around the coastal rocks of Cornwall. It breaks on the cliffs, but also there's a, quite often rocks that are sort of five meters out, 20 meters out, and the, the sea breaks over that. So there's white bits. And there's a, a poem by the English poet Alfred Lord Tennyson about a, an eagle who is high up on cliffs like that. And the eagle is looking down and it describes the sea as crawling. Beneath him, the sea crawls. And um, that image holds quite strong in my mind that when you're high up on a cliff above the water, above the sea, it looks as if it's crawling. And um, so a mixture of that poem and reality that's what that sea is looking like. Because when you're that high up, you can't hear it. So, you know, when you're on a beach, mm, mm. one of the most sort of affecting things is the sound of the sea and the crashing on the rocks um, and the sort of foam. But when you're high up, it's more like it's a sort of living thing. A crawl is a bit of personification, after all, that the sea is crawling. So when I look down, the sea is doing what Tennyson said it's doing, <laughs> crawling. Right. And the colour of that would be, would there be foam with the rocks or would it mainly yes, be a bluey black? That's or, right. Or, it's, it's a long way away. Um, but the sea is, because is, it's a grey day, you know, sort of the English sea always ends up looking grey. If it, it's, mm. it's not really blue or green on days like that. It's a sort of darker grey than the sky. So, yeah, the sea is, is grey and crawling. Yes. Grey and crawling, right. Okay, thank you. Um, do you remember this? Uh, another person has written in to say, do you remember the sound of the voices in the dream? No. Um, it's more egotistical than that. I can only hear me mm. shouting and thinking. Mm. <laughs> can you, can you help, help me? Help? It, it's, it's, so it's me calling out and then I'm describing my sort of it's nearly panic. It's not quite panic. It's it's sort of, yeah, urgent and a bit frightened and frightened mm. on Emma's behalf. Mm. Will she get me through and get through herself without falling down the cliff herself? Right. So as you describe it in the book, it's not really replies or statements or whatever from other people or it's you shouting yeah. for help and them helping you. Yes. Or it's one man the other side failing to do so, trying but failing and another man succeeding yep. to, uh, to pull you through. Exactly. Um, we haven't had any more uh, questions. Um, I mean, the, the situation is quite interesting, is that, it, right, so there are these phases. So you've got that I'm unconscious, and then I'm still in intensive care for a few more days while they watch to see whether I'm getting better. They're happy about that, so that's about eight, nine days. Then they put me on a ward, and as it happens, it was a geriatric ward in order to see whether I still needed more care. So I'm out of intensive care. I think the dream may have come then, when I was in intensive care for a bit more, or then I had three weeks in a rehabilitation hospital. So the three weeks in the rehabilitation hospital were in their own way incredibly stimulating, 
but at the same time quite frightening because I couldn't stand up and I couldn't walk. And so three or even four people had to, I'm quite a big bloke, okay? Um, so in English measurements, I'm six foot two. In metric, I'm 188 or something like that. Um, and I had a tremendous sense of uh, being stuck as somebody who wouldn't progress. But then there was progress. But there's a whole period where I, I thought, oh, I'm a person who can't walk, or I'm a person who will have to use a Zimmer frame. And there's a guy on our, where, where I used to live who, who uh, used a Zimmer. And I thought, oh, I'm like him now, am I? And then I had a wheelchair. And I thought, oh, right, I'm a wheelchair person. So at each stage, as I learned how to walk, and then they did teach me how to walk, first with a stick and then without, was a sense of a new plateau of stuckness. Mm. And it's only, mm. but there was progress at the same time. So, but maybe it's, it's my sensibility that saw that I resigned myself to my state of stuckness. And so partly I see the dream as, as even representing that, that, oh, I see, I'm, I'm a stuck in the wall person, am I? Mm. No, I need to get through. Mm. And then meanwhile, I mean, you, you can figure out, Emma was at home. She wasn't allowed ever to come into the hospital because of the pandemic. And of course, I wondered what she was doing. So she's separate from me. And we sometimes are able to talk, but not always, because I had to get people to help me use the phone and so on. So the separation from Emma, you know, is in the dream, isn't it? And also, how she, you know, how she, can she help me? Yeah. Uh, well, she did. She sent in raisins, which, yes, you know, that. that is just about, you know, I mean, what is better than that? Because the porridge in the morning was lovely, but can you imagine porridge with raisins? Yes. And so I would sit there sipping the porridge mm. with Emma's raisins in, and then she gave me, she sent in a duvet, the blanket, because I had such low blood pressure. I was getting cold. And so I sort of, well, I wrapped myself in Emma, didn't I? And then et Emma, you know, with the, with the sultanas and feeling the sultanas like that. And so I was relying on her to kind of hang in there, really. But she was two miles away, which I describe as a gulf. It was like it could have been 2,000 miles away, really, because she couldn't come in and see me. Um, and in the end, she did, um, because they were so worried I couldn't wake up. Because, you know, the problem with these comas is that you, you sometimes can't wake up. So I would have been aware of the anxiety going on around me mm. that, well, in the, in the words of the consultant, was they didn't know whether I was brain dead or not. Because I had this, you probably can't see, but this eye is the, it dilated. I don't know if you can see my eyes are different. So, and so they thought that indicated brain damage. And so they asked Emma to come in. Mm. And so she came onto the fourth floor. People will know Turn Again Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. Turn Again Whittington. Well, that's where the hospital is. It overlooks London. And she came in on the fourth floor and held my hand and played me recordings of our children and my older children talking to me. And the consultant said that was the game changer. That was where, you know what she did? She pulled me through or pushed me through mm. the wall because mm. I was stuck. Mm. And then what happened was they took me to the lift. You could, if you want to pursue the metaphor, they pushed me through, got to the lift. I couldn't turn around to say goodbye to Emma because I couldn't have the strength, didn't have the strength. And the consultant said at that moment, I was blah, 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 like I am now. I'd, 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 mm. From not talking at all. Yes. And so that was the change. So whether people told me that and then I reimagined it in my dream metaphorically, but it, it does represent all that sense of helplessness. And look, we have the metaphor pulling through, don't we? Mm. He pulled through. Mm. 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 So, you know, we dream metaphorically. So, you know, and the metaphors are sometimes embedded in the language. So, yeah, yes. I pulled through. You pulled through. Yes. <laughs> well, I didn't. They yes, pulled me they through. Pulled you through. I tried quite hard to die, but I mean, um, you know, they wouldn't let me. Yes. We've, we've had a question. Yes, you being pulled through and we've got another question of were the other people around so these are not the people who are necessarily pulling you through 
but these are the other ones, other than these two two men. Were they tourists or locals, or was there any? They're sense tourists. They yeah, right. um, you you can always tell in places in uh, in England. People will know this or anywhere probably. Uh, who are locals and who are tourists? You know, locals do not wear these kind of drab, sort of dull green. Even the yellow is always kind of dull, and the locals don't wear that. They they seem to wear kind of bashed up suits and things, but tourists don't wear bashed up suits. They always have to wear the anorak. The anorak is operational, you see, showing mm. that I'm coping with the English weather. Mm. And uh, they're walking around very purposefully with, with things and they say, ah, that's the West Arch. Mm. That's, that was built in mm, 893, what, what would you? Mm. So that's, that's the sort mm. of thing they're doing. And, um, but they're indifferent to me. I managed to grab these two, you see, so I pick them out from the, largely indifferent groups working around on these surfaced walkways. Yes. And, oh, I forgot to ask about that. The surface walkways. So they're a sort of brown. What color are they're, they? They're uh, like like school playgrounds, school yards, you know, the t tarmac. Mm. So um, when you look at very old pictures, in fact, some mm. here, old pictures of sort of ruined churches and things from the 19th century, they used to have gravel walkways, but Sometime from the 1930s onwards, they put tarmac, tarmacadam on them. Um, and uh, it's quite noticeable, really, because it's sort of a modern work surface that's very different from these old stones that are weathered. So you get quite a contrast. I can see that quite clearly of the, the beautiful weathered stones of the ruined church. And then you have these walkways, which um, always tempt children to run very fast along. Right. Yes. Though right. there were no children. I, I don't know what yes. we did. I really don't know what I did with the children. It's a bit, I'm quite sad about that now. Yes. Yes. But you've got school yard type walkways. Yes. So is that black or is that brown? That's it. Well, like that? it's, so it's, it's, it's up like roads, isn't it? you know, it's, it's yes, a, it's a sort of grey colour, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's a sort of right. grey colour. Usually it's, they're a bit lighter than, than roads because they're not as worn, but um, hmm. yeah, it's a right. sort of medium gray color right. yeah it's all it's all a bit gray isn't it in yes. fact no no yeah. that's english yes, weather that's right yeah. um was the man who helped old or young hmm i don't yeah i think if you asked me the day after i had the dream i might have hmm. put an age to him but um I, it's a bit indeterminate, I'm afraid. Yes, I can't really answer that. Right. Yeah. Okay. And were you your current age? Yes, it, I was me. It, yes. it's, it's in the. It's very much sort of. That's actually what's quite disturbing about the dreams I was having. That these weren't dreams of childhood or dreams of something from ten years ago or something. They were as if it's the present and. Right, I haven't said was that um, Emma describes it because she was told by the doctors I was experiencing delirium. Mm. And mm. this is quite usual for people who've in intensive care because in their words, not mine, I, my mind, my brain was full of mind changing drugs. <laughs> One of the doctors says that to me. I don't know why I'm laughing, but it is quite funny, really. Because she came to me and she said, are you having nightmares? And I said, well, they're not exactly nightmares. And she said, because, you know, your brain is full of mind changing drugs. And I kind of thought about that. It was, you know, I, I, I can remember the 60s quite well. I didn't take any mind changing drugs. I'm not saying that as a kind of piece of cosmetics, but I really didn't. I promise you. Um, in fact, I never have. It's sort of one of those strange things I have about wanting to keep control, you know. And um, so I, I never took mind changing drugs. So here she is telling me the doctor that I've taken these mind changing drugs. And so I'm going to have delirium, I'm going to have hallucinations. And I did, I, other than that dream, there's some other quite strange dreams. And they disturbed me because mm. they weren't any different from being awake. Right. Mm. So normally we wake mm. up mm. and we say, I had a dream last night that I told you one that I had mm. last night. Yeah. Mm. And I can distinguish between dream and awake. In the days after I woke up, I don't think I could distinguish between awake and asleep. Mm -hmm. So yes. that dream, mm -hmm. I think 
while I was having it, I thought I was awake, which we do. But after I woke up, I wasn't sure whether for quite a while, whether I had been there or not. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different state of mind from our usual, I had a dream last night. Mm. Like, and there were times when I was lying there and it was during the day and I would have a dream and I'd think that I'd sort of daydreamed it willfully. So it was as if my self-will was more present than normally dreams are. If we have the sense that they're involuntary mm. and we can't, mm. it's just the dream happened. Mm. In those first days after the coma, I felt that if I shut my eyes, I could daydream and will anything along. So this mm. dream comes somewhere mm. in that situation where I could almost will the dream to happen. And most of the dreams in the book I had several times. The Land's End dream, this one we're talking about today, I had it at least three times. Oh, nice. And I could sort of self-will it. Mm. I could go, do the Land's End one. Mm. Yes. And then I could, I could conjure up the image mm. and make it happen. Mm. And maybe some of that is, to, is due to the p uh, persistence of the drug. I don't know the drugs. Yes. I, don't, I don't know what they were. I don't know what drugs they gave me, but um, obviously they've got to knock you out and also give you happy drugs of various kinds that we probably don't need to mention. Yes. But uh, there'll be various yes. things they gave me so that I wasn't in pain. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. Um, did the dream end the moment you were finally pulled through? Mm. And do you remember how you felt at that moment? <clears throat> I think, yes, I got through, and this is a bit disturbing for me because it doesn't go on and I don't pull Emma through. So I've left mm. Emma behind. Mm. And I, you know, it, anyone can legitimately say, and Emma? <laughs> and I go, yeah, well, I don't know, really. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a bit but you can't necessarily be kind in a dream, can you? Uh, even though I've talked about self-willing. But anyway, I've, so I've left Emma, so it's, it's a kind of reflection of my own egotism, really. Mm. Um, but, uh, and I think I just felt relief that I'd got through. I, yes, I definitely feel a sense of, Phew, yeah, I've made it, yes. Um, which I don't think I actually felt in relation to COVID until I got home. Mm. I think my kind of extrusion from the system, in mm. equivalent to the extrusion from the wall, was uh, literally walking through the door and seeing the family who had actually put out little triangular flags, you know, little bunting flags mm. saying welcome home mm. for me, which was quite amazing. And I can see my two youngest children standing on the stairs as I walk into the hall, um, kind of looking at me sort of, oh blimey, you do look quite odd, sort of look on their faces. Um, and Emma had said I wasn't allowed to come home until I could walk without mm, the, a wheelchair or the stick. Yes. That was the deal. I said, no, I said, I'll be coming home with the stick. No, you won't. Yes. I said, oh, I think I might, no, you won't. I said, well, it might be a wheelchair. No, it won't. Uh, right. Okay, fine. So it was a Good effort. I walked from the ambulance through the door into the house. I did that. Yes, yes. that was about 30 strides. Yeah. Right. And that was quite a bit after the dream. It occurred, was, but so. you can see all these analogies. I mean, because you've also mm. got another situation is when I decide to write it down, mm. there's another time frame. So we, you can cheat a bit. There's the time frame of the dream, but then there's the time frame of writing it down. So now you're dealing with, well, you know, it's a good, here we are in the Freud Museum. Why do you remember things? So it, the persistence of memory. So of course I've chosen to remember it. So I've chosen to remember it at a point at which I'm sitting at home writing these poems. So that's of its own significance. Yes, and you've put it into the second recovery part of the yes. book. Yes, you know, because I'm thinking it, it possibly belongs to the first part. But anyway, we. But it's still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, great. Now we've got we've got a very large number of, of comments, but we will have to uh, stop this little bit of it so just sort of briefly, because I think we've got enough details of the dream there. Um, there's only there's one question about whether or not there was any attitude of the two men who pulled you through. But, I can only see them as um, capable guys. I mean, a bit, I'm going to mention my brother now. I, I always see my brother 
as a kind of eminently capable bloke. He's, he's, he's a paleontologist of fossils, and he's always tinkering with things, building sheds, and, and he always wears anoraks as well, he's, and camps, and you know, does field trip things. <laughs> always a little hammer and things. You know? So these people are a bit like my brother, in the sense that um, they're used to the outdoors and they're used to they're, you know, wearing these anoraks like my brother does. And my brother's anoraks always look well worn. He's never got a new anorak because hmm. he's been out there, you know, in, in the English countryside. So these are kind of proto Brian <coughs> people, Brian, my brother's name, or Bryce, as I call him. So these are proto Bryzes. Um, I can see them now. Yes, they are. They're a bit like Brian. So, um, yep. And also, whenever Bryce shows me pictures of his mates and they found a quarry, you know, with a, a, a vein of something in it and mm. so on, they're all standing with faded English anoraki things on. So mm. they're, they're, they're in that ilk. I've, I've placed those guys as, as like Brian. They're not Brian, but they're like him. Yeah. Is that a matter of fact sort of person? When faced with the stuff, yes, it, he just gets on, he just does it, mm. you know. Um, mm. He's not a matter of fact bloke in particular, mm. you know, he's um, full of stories and fun, jokes and so on. Um, but he's quite matter of fact, face to face with them, um, you know, a problem with the water feature in the garden or with them. Um, a bit of the shed that needs repairing, you know, he just, yes. he gets on and does it. Whereas I go, uh, 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 the, the, the door won't close. Uh, what do we do? Yes. You know, he would go, right, I think I need to plane that. And I'm going, oh, uh, I used to have a plane. I haven't got one anymore. This happened quite genuinely three weeks ago. So I sat there going, uh, can't shut the door. Uh, yeah. Right, so he gets on with it. He does. Just as the second man in the dream got on with pulling yeah. you, pulling you through. Yeah. So thank you. I, th I think we've got the dream there in mind. We've got loads of detail. And I'm very grateful to all the questions of, uh, for all of that. Now, during this, we, we follow a, a procedure that's been used worldwide and which has been devised in order to properly appreciate a dream or a properly sort of map the dream onto waking life, although Michael's been doing quite a bit of that already um, for us. And the, the next stage in doing this, before we come back to Michael to ask what was going on in Michael's uh, time at that, at that time, although Michael's already said quite a bit about that, is we have a very brief time where people think, so that we can all get into the dream, we can all think, what would it be like if I'd had that dream? Now, in thinking about it from our own point of view, we're not imposing anything on it about what it must mean for Michael, but it's a way of, in a way, socializing it, but it's in a way of us trying to understand the importance of that dream, to think of it as in terms of what would happen if that happened to me. So what I'd ask people to do now is, and we've only got time for a few people to do this, and. If you do this, it may or may not be helpful to Michael at all, what you, what you type in. But just think, what would it have been like if it happened to me? And this doesn't impose any meaning on Michael's dream. It's just as a way of Michael, say, knowing how this would be for other people. So if, if one or two people could type something in, that would be great. I mean, my only thought about this, if I had a dream like this, is I occasionally have them, but I have a terrible fear of heights. And if I was over a cliff, uh, and if I was over a cliff with my wife, you know, she would be looking after me and making sure that I wasn't tipping over the edge and wasn't too close to the edge and wasn't freaking out or whatever. And I would be really quite concerned about uh, being next to a cliff because of uh, worries about heights. And I'd certainly be trying to retrieve my way out of that uh, situation. Um, we haven't had any comments in, which is absolutely fine because uh, it does. If, if anybody wished to do so, I'll you're, just you're more than welcome. Something oh, about yeah. the height. You mm. see, yes, I'm afraid of that height. I'm okay-ish on heights. Um, you know, I've been up the Eiffel Tower, I've been up the Empire State Building. I've even tragically been up the Twin Towers uh, a couple of well, a few years before they were. You know went down um, and uh, I get, you know, you get the funny sort of queasy feeling. Um, 
I bring up the Statue of Liberty. Um, so that's fine, but of course, um, I've had this dizziness and vertigo. So, right. um, and with the vertigo, I mean, if people have had anything like this, it's nothing to do with height. The, the real vertigo is you lie like this. So I was in bed and now you've got to imagine this whole room spinning. So it spins, but not right the way around. So it goes and then as if like it goes again and again. So this is in my vertigo anyway. So if you imagine it slides and then the same image slides again and then it goes again and again. Mm. and you can't stop it so there's a sense of kind of well it's it's scary and also you feel dizzy as well but the sight is is really quite scary so i don't know whether i had those i know i felt dizzy i'm not sure i quite had vertigo in hospital but certainly i was worried about the dizziness and the, and mm. and so on they did ask me about it and said maybe you're not drinking enough or something like that um but in actual fact it's because my inner ears are damaged um semicircular canals those of you who remember they're the ones that we do our balance with so i basically lose my sense of balance so that connects with the dream as well doesn't it so the moment you said that i got mm. a sudden sort of vibe of oh yeah and then I looked down and I felt wobbly mm. just when you mm. said you don't mm. like heights. Mm. I looked down, had that funny little mm. feeling that you get. But then I remembered the vertigo as well. So it does connect with all that. And, you know, and clearly there's a sense, you know, any of these things, the vertigo and the, the height thing. I mean, it is connected to our fear of death, isn't it? It's, it's Thanatos and all that. We go, it's trying to pull me there. It's trying, mm. I'm going to fall. I'm going to you know all those images of fall and um and the end and so on you know i'm at land's end after all mm. um mm. and so uh and as you know from the book i did think about a lot about my mum and my dad and my son I, I lost a son um as well so i did find myself thinking about how they died i thought about the way we die and I did ask myself at times, is this the way I'm going to die? Mm. Even when I didn't mm. really know, because it, I haven't said, I didn't know that I'd had COVID. I, mean, I know this sounds mad, but mm. do you see, I was whisked to the hospital. Nobody said I had COVID. Um, then I'm put in a coma. Yes. Then I wake up and nobody at that stage actually says you had COVID. Mm. I don't think I got that I had COVID till I got to the rehabilitation hospital and people said, I think somebody came and took a blood test and said, hmm, well, you had COVID, you know, and I went, oh, right. And that sort of rung a bell, like maybe somebody had said earlier. Yes. But at the time, I didn't know. But so when I was just lying there in the, what was the geriatric ward, I found myself thinking, is this how I die? My dad died in hospital. My mum died at home and I saw my mum die. And I as I say in the book, I didn't mm. see my son die, but I came into his bedroom and found him dead. Mm. Mm. So I thought, am I going to lie here and then die? Is that what's going to ha is that how, how it happens? Yes. So I am thinking about that yes. in the period of all this going on. I'm trying to yes. sort of figure out the way to die. Is this something you can practice doing? Yes. And well, in a way that that's what literature is. Literature helps you practice dying. Uh, mm. not all literature is about death of course but quite a lot of it does so mm. you can sort of practice doing it mm. yes oh thank you yes um we have had one person say i once had a dream where i was stuck and was terrified being afraid i would never be able to move mm. no similarity to a physical real world but probably to a mindset so whereas you have mentioned your physical situation she's that for her it's it's more of a mindset mm, interpretation the, she has of the dream yes indeed and another one of my dreams in the book i am stuck i'm in a garden i won't tell the whole dream but one of the things i'm aware of hoping they're not aware that i can't actually move my legs so at that stage when i had that dream sorry to leap to another dream i didn't know that i couldn't stand up and couldn't walk but i dreamt it i preempted the fact so yes. my dream, I'm sitting in a garden with blankets around me. And I know that I can't move my legs and I hope that the other people in the garden don't know. 
Yes. But that was a sort of symbolic representation of my state without me consciously knowing. Again, maybe people said, you know, you can't walk or not. I don't know because I can't remember that. So, yes, the stuckness is, is very significant. Yes, indeed. Oh, great. Yes. Well, thank you. So that's so that's been some responses to other people, how it would be for them if, if it happened. That's just a very brief stage of this procedure. And what we now come to is returning the dream to Michael and just asking Michael some of the some people have already been commenting on this, actually, to just say, because now we talk about what was happening at the time of the dream. So now we need now it would be great to know what was going on. You've already said that it's more fitting to the the part one type of recovery where you're in the the wards. You 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 did have worries about dying at the time, um, and also worries about being stuck physically. So you've got the the physical stuckness plus also the will I make it? I assume of of staying alive. Mm. Um, so what what was happening? Can you remember much around the time yeah. of the so um indeed so let's imagine so i'm now on a ward and i'm in a a little alcove to one side of the main ward and i now know it was a geriatric ward so i can't actually see many of the other patients i if i just lean a bit i can just see a foot sticking out over there and in all the times that i had this incredible treatment and it's ongoing i'm, I'm sort of regularly going to the uh, ophthalmologist at the hospital just down the road here. Um, this was the one time when there was a little bit of tension between the nurses and me, and I've, I haven't quite put my finger on it, but I think it, and I have raised the matter with the hospital uh, in retrospect, excuse me. <clears throat> there seems to have been some sort of tension between the different groups of nurses, and also that they felt I had a very strange encounter where I was lying there one day and one of the nurses said, well, what are you in here for anyway? I remember looking at her and saying, well, I, d I don't know. It's probably in my notes. Wow. And th there were two nurses who thought that somehow or other I, I was some sort of fraud or a kind of joke because I, I was clearly I can see myself speaking quite articulately and I can by then move my arms but I couldn't move my legs and I didn't know at that point I couldn't say to them do you know I've been in a coma for 40 days because I didn't know so all I could say was well look at my notes now if I put myself in their shoes here are these people in the last stages of their life in a geriatric ward and I'm sitting there Da, 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 mm. you know, you know mm. all lovely raisins in my, yes. you know, and I, you know, I'm not going to describe what the state that they were in, but if they're in a geriatric ward, they are probably in their last days, mm. whereas I didn't look like I was. Mm. So there was this tension. And then one night, I've described this, I pulled out this mm. nasal mm. gastric yes. tube. Mm. And the nurse, it was at night, and the nurse came in, put on the big arc lights, and proceeded to stick it back down my throat in the middle of the night. Yes. And I was saying, well, they're going to take it out tomorrow anyway. And she was quite cross about it. And I think I said at one point, you don't need to be so aggressive. I don't, I don't know. I think somewhere out of the recesses of my mind, I said this to her. And she said, uh, she had quite a strong accent, actually. And she said, I, I'm not being aggressive. And so there was this sort of standoff that went on and it got to, to reach the peak where one night um, a, a young nurse, I think she thought it was funny. She wouldn't let me have my night buzzer. You can see me groping right. for it here. Can you see yes. me? Like, so I'm yeah. miming it. it it's yes. here, you see. And, and she said, you can't have it. And I got upset and I rang Emma mm. and Emma said pass 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 it over and so she i passed my phone over to her and she said give michael his buzzer he said it must hurt you know and um she did and they all whispered amongst themselves i could see the nurses saying, he's from home he's from home he's from home <laughs> and i felt this sort of sense of isolation and there's a poem in there which i i mean it, it, emma and me we, we remember it is where i say can i come home mm. Yes, and I goes, well, no, yeah. you can't, you mm. can't, you can't walk, you know, mm. and I said, well, couldn't I come home mm. 
can I come home at night and then go back for the yes, day? I remember that. No, you can't. And I'm like really upset, actually. I've sort of made it seem as I'm not as upset as because I remember thinking that Emma had let me down. I mean, I, you know, it's terrible when I look back mm. at it. But mm. I sort of thought, well, you know, what Emma could have said, I could come out. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you're, this is somebody who literally couldn't stand up and I was going, could I come mm. home at night? And I imagined mm. my bed being like kind of wheeled down the road. Mm. you know going home wonderful so i could spare the nights with these night nurses not let me have my yes. my buzzer okay because yes, yes, yes. i you know your other anxiety is not only dying but one that you'll wet yourself or you'll poo yourself it's sort of the anxieties mm. of hospital mm. life and so and i did on, on one occasion i had a catheter to deal with the wee but um that i i did think well if i don't have the buzzer and that that feels so sort of it's when you lose some aspect of your your ability to control yourself so i'm saying all this mm. as saying that the dream takes place at the time of some of these anxieties and worries and the only moment of abrasion with with the nurses who were you know as i say 99.9 percent .9 wonderful it was just this two or three days in the geriatric ward and mm. i just think that they I've, I've talked about it with the hospital i think there was a little lack of communication we always say of connect up saying this bloke's been in a coma for 40 days he's got to be in a geriatric ward for, for 14 days or something like that maybe not as long 10 days and then he's going off anyway so just you know keep him happy chuck chuck him some you know chuck him a cake or something you know? right. <laughs> but, but instead right. there was sort of irritation that somehow or other i was in, in there for a cushy ride and it was <clears throat> right oh i see so in, in some respects from one point of view, you're weller than you should be. Yes. Um, but were, were you still at that point having worries that you might die or hopes yes. that you will pull, pull through? As, as I think, uh, yeah, because I didn't know what was wrong with me. Mm. I mean, they would, right. I've, I've described this as well. Doctors kept coming to see me and they would stand over me and say, you were very poorly. Mm. And I'd go, right. But, you know, you've done really well. And it was only about three, four weeks later that I had an idea of the immensity of what I'd been through, mm. because I, all I could remember was Emma driving me to the hospital, two or three days on a ward, and now I was on another ward. But that 40 plus the recovery period, the 50 days, that was a blank to me. So, mm. and I didn't read the, the patient diary and Emma hadn't fully explained it to me. She tried, but I, I kind of resisted and didn't mm. understand it anyway. So it was only when I got home that I had a sense of this. I mean, it's a long time to be unconscious, isn't it? Yes. You know, I, I mean, if you're knocked out in a bad accident or a boxer or something, it's, you know, it might be half an hour, one hour. Yes. You know, a couple of days, something like that. But 40 days, it's, what is it? Uh, did my sums here? Mm, seven yeah, five. Weeks, was it seven fives of thirty-five? Yes. So it's six. Yeah, it yes, is. It's six, six weeks, weeks six, unconscious. Yes. yes. And of course, your body's degenerated. It's just flab. It's just rubbish. Yes. I mean, you know that 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 hurt. I couldn't do that. Yes. Because the stomach muscles are gone completely. See. Wow. So, but I had no mm. sense that I'd I'd been ill. So there's this kind of mystery gulf. No, I, yes. I didn't know about. Uh, it's it's very hard to describe. I mean, the only way I've tried to describe it is mythologically. You know, I've, I've turned to Freud. You know, I've done the same thing. I've gone to the Odyssey mm. and said that I went to the land of the dead. Yeah, and that I that. broke the rules because yes. I got past yes. the dog, yes. and then I broke the rules because I got out again, didn't I? So you know, Freud turned uh, yes. to to ancient Greek mythology because obviously he thought these were the phantoms of our unconscious mind um, and that somehow or other the ancient Greeks were sort of more honest about it maybe than mm. later civilizations that they could represent Echo, Narcissus, Persephone and so on and Hades mm. and, and in a way I found that yes I thought well that that thing of Od Odysseus cheating mm. and getting in and then coming out again and it represented how I felt and, but I did leave some things behind I left my eye and my ear behind and yes. They're waiting for me, yes. looking out for me. 
this yeah. lesson. So they're there, yeah. Yes. Right, so all that was happening at yeah. the time. And you've, you've, uh, you've said that the church seems to come from a sort of Lindisfarne yeah. sort of uh, ruins type of thing. But the idea of Land's End, is Land's End, I mean, you've, you've mentioned, you know, Land's End, you know, the end, you know, yes. coming to the end of the, the land and there, out there is the great ocean. But, it, but does Land's End have any significance um, apart from that? Start sort of with Lindisfarne. Emma and I and the family have been there with this, this place that we've walked, that is in the dream, we've, we've walked around. So yes, this is a place inhabited by me and Emma and the, and the kids. So we've walked around there and we often talk about it. We do say, oh, wasn't that amazing? And that it was overlooking the, the, the cliffs there as it happens, uh, not as hairy as the Cornish ones. Um, and I've been to Land's End, I don't think with Emma, but I have been to Land's End. Um, and um, I mean, there's one bit that's very banal, it's just a car park. But, um, uh, but I've been various places with these kinds of cliffs. Um, but for the, for the common experience between me and Emma, then Lindisfarne, uh, we, we both talk about and remember quite well. And you've got Lindisfarne, you've got Holy Island, you've got, um, you've got the church on the top, and then you've got the causeway out to Holy Island. Um, I think I'm possibly muddling Lindisfarne with Holy Island, but anyway, um, people much better on geography will remember, but we're, we're in the, church that's on the mainland looking out over towards Holy Island where you can drive out on the causeway mm. um, which in itself is a danger thing because they give huge warnings because it's mm. a causeway that's a tidal causeway mm. um, they, they say you know you've got to get off the island now you won't get off till 24 hours later and then there's strange weird people who think oh I can leave it a bit you know and then terrible things happen so there's a causeway that Covers with covered over mm. with the sea, but then mm. when the tide's down, you can get across mm. at the moment. Um, so we often talk about that. Um, so that's quite clear in my mind that the church and what it looks like, the remains of the church, the ruins. Yes, I mean, you could I say while you're listening to this, you could bring it up. It's mm. the church on the mainland looking mm. out over Holy Island. Yeah. Yes, which is obviously a place of danger because you've got you you can start walking across the seabed, yeah, and the the sea coming in. So it's yeah. a, a family place. Plus but big warning, big signs up saying danger, danger. So right, yeah, full... and Land's End. It's just that you've been there, and yes. but it's also got the word the end in it. And it's... and I do have a child memory which I often come back to. Okay, so this is North Yorkshire. We're on holiday. Uh, just near Whitby, and I go out looking for bird spotting with my binoculars. And I'm about 11 or 12, and there's a wooden fence that stops you going over into the cliffs. And like a complete jerk, and I keep coming back to it, I climbed over this fence in order um... to get a better look at what I was sure was a fulmar, which is quite a rare-ish. Not that rare, but rare, rare to my eyes, seabird that was sitting on some eggs. Yes. Because it got up and then sat down again. And so, in order to get nearer to it, I climbed over this fence. Mm. And when I bring that memory back, that's the cliff that is sort of in the dream. Right. So, it's another, so I'm high up and I should, of course, shouldn't have climbed over it, but, you know, yes. 12 year old. Yes. Um, I want to get this thing and maybe I was trying to take a picture. Ah, yes, that's it. I have my funny little old camera. I was trying to take a picture of the fulmar. And so I thought I'd get nearer. But of course, it was sloping down. So when I mm. play that story back to me, I mm. feel danger. It's not vertigo, but I can feel a bit way. Stop now, Michael. Yes. Why have you done this? But of course, I can't stop myself because it I did it. And it yes. um, Yes, it's kind of a, it, it represents for me, I think, my parents were very libertarian, perhaps almost too much so, and let me sort of go off for hours and almost a whole day on my own when I was quite, mm. from what time I was quite young. Mm. And I'd come back in the evening and say, where have you been? I said, I've been with my friends and they wouldn't even ask me who. So right. no, they were very, quite strange, you know. And so I would go off to go and look bird spotting and they'd say, did you see it? Yeah, yeah, all right, lovely, great. 
Wow. But you've ended up with a memory, a oh, childhood yeah. memory of a cliff. Yes. A time of great danger. Yes. Of, 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 and yes. And not feeling the danger things. at the time, but feeling the danger retrospectively. So that's kind of quite right for whatever your mind does in culling memories to create dreams, mm. if, if I've given the right yes. description, that it's sort of culled that memory in order to put it into this moment where I'm feeling sort of helpless and stuck in the hospital at this time. So it's sort of, yes. if you think of a sort of dream as a kind of octopus that goes out and collects things, mm. then it's collected that fulmar moment. Yes. Is that the word? Is it fulmar, the, the bird? I think it is, isn't it? Um, there's a petrol and there's a fulmar, I think. Anyway, and it sort of collected that and sort of dumped it in my dream and then it's collected Northumberland, you know, the, yes. the, the Lindisfarne thing, collected that. And, Yes. Bung that in the dream as well. Uh, yes. And one of the things Freud was so interested in was he was saying, well, how does the dream choose what it needs to represent something? So you're representing extreme danger. And so, you know, like you said, like an octopus, it goes out and grabs something from your life to put that in yeah. as that representation. The funny thing is, of course, that the physiological dream researchers who are not so much interested in meaning and things like that, then say, oh, well, look, it's just a, a mishmash of your, your life's experiences, but according to Freud, yes, but why is it that one? It's, well, indeed, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a the cliff great, escapade as a child. It's the great literary question, I isn't it? There. I mean, you know, someone who spends their time writing things, sometimes making up stuff, it doesn't feel that different. Dreaming, to me, doesn't feel much, all that much more different from, let me think up a story now. Mm. And in fact, Freud writes about that as well, doesn't mm. he? That uh, writers, we're sort of a bit infantile, he describes us, yes. I think, doesn't he? That we're sort of stuck in the kind of daydream of a child's daydream, that yes. that's what we do. And I sort of accept that in a way, that what, what I do if I'm going to make up a story is I'm sort of going round, selecting bits. And of course, the Freudian and ideological question is, well, why did you choose that bit rather than another? Mm. It's not totally random, is it? You know, if you dreamt yes. of the kettle boiling or, or if you decided that the hero goes over, hero or heroine goes over to the kettle and the kettle's boiling. Well, why did you choose that? Yes. So that's, yes. those are great questions. I love those. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. No, that's true. There's loads of the, the, the people who write about fiction from the psychology, psychological point of view saying it's a simulation of people's reality and their social reality usually and, and dreams similar. Yeah. So, no, yes. I, I, I uh, always yes. encourage my students to look at uh, Elizabeth Wright's very good book, Psychoanalytic Criticism. I don't really you know it, but oh, right. it's I a really good book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Elizabeth wow. Wright? Yes, I think it is. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, amazing that you've got, you've got that childhood memory coming through. Now, if anybody had any comments about Michael's life and experiences and pandemic experiences around that time, do please ask. But I think we've got quite a lot there already. So we might move on to the next part, which is just very brief, where I read the dream back to Michael in the second person. And this is all part of this oh, right. accredited method. Oh, lovely. Um, so so oh, people like are, are not only getting Michael today, this is also the method that's used in lay groups around the world who are interested in dreams to appreciate dreams. That before we start tying together waking life to the dream, which you've done a lot of already, mm. uh, I read the dream back to you in the second person. Very good. Um, That's page. So, sorry. 231, if so, I will read it out that you're at Land's End. Uh, what was it page 231 yeah. yes yeah. so you're at land's end um it's not in here but we we've uh, you've said now it was a very gray drizzly day and the sea was matching that with its gray drizzledness you climbed over a stone wall with emma your wife on the other side you noticed that you and emma were at the top of a cliff there's a sheer drop hundreds of feet down you said that you wanted to go back over the wall, but you noticed a big hole in the wall. So you squeezed into it so that you could get through, but you got stuck. You shouted to Emma, push, Emma, push. Emma did push, but you couldn't get through. Then you noticed that there were other people walking around. And these are tourists, uh, we now know, and they're, they're dressed as tourists are, but they're, they're dressed in a, in a sort of... Uh, Kaguli, um, not colourful way. 
and there was a space there like a ruined church made suitable for visitors with surfaced walkways. You called out to someone, can you pull me through? The person tried, but he couldn't do so. You felt so helpless. You were worried about Emma at the top of the cliff because you're both still at the, or she's still at the top of the cliff. You're in the hole trying to be pushed through. Emma was still pushing. Then you called out to another person who was in the ruined church. He got hold of you and pulled you through. So that's the dream. Thank you, mm. Michael. Interestingly, I've got a, a sense of, it, of the right and the left. But somehow or other, the sea's on the right and the church is on the left. So some part of me is not seeing it with my eyes. I'm almost looking at me, even in the dream, looking at me. Somehow or other, I'm doing both being in, in, the, rock, in the, the stone wall. But there's another part of me is, is I'm, I'm spectating it. Oh dear, mm. that's quite so. When you started doing that, I could suddenly see there's this little bit of green turf next to the wall before the drop. Mm. Yeah, and the sea is there there yes and then i look there so as if i'm a camera um sort of above the wall just sort of on the top of the wall and i can look down and see emma i can look down and see me and i can look into the church do you yes. see so it's a kind yes. of but at the same time i can also be me so yes it's there's a you know in film terms it's, it's two povs there's my pov point yes. of view yes and there's the camera on the wall so i've got Yes. a double POV on it and of course you you added to that by being the observer anyway yes I'm just I'm yeah observing even the observing yeah. you that's yes. right so there yes there. how strange yes there it is mm. yeah, yes. I can see it no I can I can see it as well I, I hope the audience can as well we've got yeah. the sea there which is all around really isn't it because you're on these cliffs the wall the church and the some people helping you through um, so now what we do for the, the final bit of this is just to ask Michael and also the, the people on the, in the audience just how you see as the dream and your waking life. You've said lots about your waking yes. life already and you were being pulled through yes. way by other people um, as well as being stuck physically. There's, as you put it, the metaphor of I've pulled through. Yes. Yes, well, we got the metaphor of land's end life's end mm -hmm. um we've got stuckness and we've got the incredible help um and they they you know i'm alive it, it's it's quite funny when i when i go to the park people recognize me and they go michael mm. it's alive and i go mm. yeah no it's, mm. it's you they say sorry so michael it's you and i go yeah that's right i'm alive at least i think so um and um it's quite nice because people are sort of saying, well, we didn't think you would be. Mm. Mm. And because mm. the reports that were coming out, and obviously the longer you're in a coma, people think it's less likely that you're going to come out of it, or if you are, you're going to be a wreck. So uh, when they see me walking about in Alexandra Park Park and so on, um, mm. so there is a sort of sense of, um, how can I put it? Can't quite find the words for it, but look, there's me before I got ill, there's me now, and then there's this big sort of middle stuff in the sandwich, it's a sandwich, okay, so mm. we'll, we'll go with that mm. one. So there's a slice mm. of bread before, mm. that's me, there's this different kind of bread, which is me now, and then in the middle is this kind of stuff, and um, I can't understand all of it, I can't sort of fully, I mean, I do my best mm. to express it and try mm. to understand mm. it, but... Mm because it's such a bewildering thing mm. to have happened. Mm. And some of it is COVID, but quite a lot of it is the fact that they knocked me out. And what, they, yes. what does that even mean? Yes. And what kind of human, what kind of, you know, we talk about consciousness. Mm. Well, was I conscious when I was knocked out? Mm. And then when they took me off the drugs, basically, and then waited for me to wake up, what was that state of mind? Yes. So whatever physiological uh, model we have of consciousness, what was that? Because I was talking. I mean, there's a bit on the film 
Well, it's a bit sad, really. The, the, the doctor comes up to me, this lovely Professor Hugh Montgomery, and he says, understand you've got children. And I look up at him and go, apparently. <laughs> I've got no memory of this at all. Well, what was the state of mind of that human being? I know it's Michael Rosen, but who was that? What was state of mind was I in? So mm. all these things, they're all like sort of bewildering images. So there's the dreams, mm. and then mm. now I've got the, the film and so on. And um, mm. sometimes I just sit on the sofa and I kind of let these bewildering images mm. float. They come mm. up. Mm. Uh, so yesterday, I just sort of lay on the sofa and um, sort of waited to see what would crop up from, the, from this sort of bewildering time. And it, the, the thing I try to come to terms with is the fact that hospital is an incredibly infantilizing place mm. if you're that mm. ill. Mm. You can't do anything, you know. I mean, for mm. a time, I couldn't even feed myself. Mm. So... You're basically round about two years old, mm. or even a bit younger. Yes. And um, so, and it's very difficult to come to terms with, not only then, but also in retrospect, because you, it's a sense of, well, I almost feel ashamed. Mm. I almost feel ashamed that I was so helpless, mm. which it will tell you something about me and what I, Yes. Trying, trying not to be helpless all my life, yes. um, and wanting not to be helpless. Um, mm. And so there it is in the dream as well, I'm helpless, aren't I? Yes, and calling out to strangers. Yeah. Uh, help me. To help you. Help me. And, um, I don't want to be helpless. wife helping you. You've and she can't. And, and so I'm even more helpless if she can't, mm. you know. I, yes. I, you know, rely on her for all sorts of things, obviously. Hope that she'll rely on me too. That's why I'm, I don't like being helpless because I want to be relied on. Yes. You know, yes. some no. stereotyping going on here, yes. but you know, yes. rely on me. I'm a man. <laughs> you know, I can, I can plane the door. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Uh, oh, or can I? Um, I did actually. Mm. Um, in the end, uh, I went out and bought a plane. You'll be right. pleased to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so yes. it's, do you know, they, they say, don't they, that some of the guys came back from the war and some of their difficulty, wars and stuff, they come back and they're ashamed because maybe they cried or maybe they ran away or maybe they couldn't help somebody. Mm. And it, part of the trauma, mm. I mean, I, I was brought up, obviously taught by teachers who were all traumatised by being in, the men had been in the war and so on. Yes. And part of the trauma was that, was the, that you're ripped from home and certain things where you're helpless, you know, you're being ruled by a sergeant major and you're, all sorts of things may have happened that made you helpless because you were injured or whatever. And um, I've got those senses of having been in hospital. It, it made me helpless. Yes. And the dream is quite a depiction mm. of that. Yes, we've had a we've had a question in. Um, is there a sense in which using the hole rather than climbing over the wall was a way of cheating, like cheating death? Does Michael think about Does Michael thinks about what might have happened if he tried to go over? rather than through, which immediately makes me think of your book, one of yes. your books. Yeah. But what does Michael think about the, the possibility of going over rather than uh, okay. through it? I think, it's, there is, it's, it's good, I like that. I think, I think in the dream, I'm being pretty clever. That mm. instead of going over the wall, mm. I've got this, this hole here, I could go through that, that's, that's like, Yes. You know, that's me being natty out in the country. You see, we can get through there, yes. and then I find I can't. So there's a kind of sense that um, I'm being right. So if I, because we <laughs> had a lot of holidays when I was a kid in the countryside, you learn a bit of country law one way or another, either because mm. your dad or mum or your brother will teach it to you, you know, about how you look to see a field if there's a bull in it, you know, or whether mm. you... Mm. You know, how you don't walk out to the middle of a river, all sorts of things that, you know, and how if you're walking down a hill, you zigzag rather than walk straight down, and all sorts of things that you pick up. Mm. And so I think in the dream, 
I'm being a bit natty there. I'm not going to go over the wall. The wall, could, I don't know, whatever I thought. But mm. there's that hole there. I'll go through there. So it's sort of. So I do think I'm cheating, yes, yes. because I'm being countryside and no howie and country lawish. Yes, but uh, obviously I then discover pretty quick I'm not. Yeah. Right. But that sort of, again, it sort of adds to the helplessness, isn't it, in the sense that I thought I was able, and then in fact I'm unable. Yes, oh, that's, well, that's very interesting. So I'm very grateful to that question yes. from there. And as Michael has said, there was the bit in the, um, there was the bit in the book, in fact, where, he, where you describe, Michael, the sense of, um, uh, I'm a traveler who reached the land of the dead. Yeah. I broke the rule that said I had to stay. I crossed back over the water. I dodged the guard dog. I came out, I've returned. And there's a, a sense of cheating it there. And yes. So as you've just said, with going through the hole in the wall rather than over it is, yes. a, is a cheating aspect. Yes, in fact, yeah, I think I've written about people seeing me and I'm, there's sort of a sense in which they think and I think and I think they think that I've got away with it. I've delayed death. I haven't cancelled it, though I think people mm. hope that I have mm. and hope that they have. So there's a bit of the idea that you can delay it. You know, there's an incredible folk story by, um, <coughs> written down by Italo Calvino about the guy who is told he can live forever so long as he doesn't get off his horse. Yes. And he's warned mm. that there'll be people there who will trick you to the rest of it. Nice. And uh, he's got it sorted. It's fine. It's fine. He doesn't get off the horse. Or does he? Nice. Look it up. It's the man <laughs> who wanted to live forever, I think it's called, by Italo Calvino. Absolute magic, magic story. It's, it's, you kind of return to it again and again and start thinking, would you get off the horse? No, you've been told not to. He does. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> oh. Right, thank you. Right. So there was a, a cheating the death of that, that way. Um, do you feel that the experience or dreams and thinking about them now as you're speaking will help you cope better with the disabilities that remain in body and mind? I, I yes, yes, indeed. No, no. I mean, you know, I, I, I believe in this thing of extemporizing, putting outside of you your experiences and feelings. I, yes, I totally believe in it, whether that's the talking cure, whether it's uh, writing, or whether it's dancing, or whether it's making pots, or whether it's painting. Um, that This idea that we have consciousness that exists, and in a way exists behind big walls. Things get in, but it's very hard for it to get out. And when we do bring it out of ourselves, in whatever form of shape of expression, I believe that that's a form of release, form of relief, and also um, provides fresh things to contemplate because you're contemplating bits of yourself outside of yourself. So in a way, to pursue the analogy, it sort of relieves the pressure in your brain. I've had a lot of time thinking about pressure in my eyes because they've both been I've got glaucoma as a result of COVID. So I keep listening to the ophthalmologist talking mm. about the idea of pressure building up in these globes that are in your head. And I sort of think of the brain as a bit like eyes in that there's the pressure of experience and pain and distress. And then you go, Chow. so it's like a little tube out of your head and then you write it down and then you can look at it. And this is a great relief on sort of brain glaucoma, if you like, mm. mind glaucoma. Mm. Mm. And so you look at it and you go, oh, right. So that dream, in its own way, it was quite painful to have and then painful to, ha to self-will it in the way I've described, but I mm. did sometimes and have, have again. Mm. And so I get, and then, but when I put it down on the page, it almost comes to be funny in a kind of absurd sort of way that, that mm. if you have a sense of humor that likes absurdism, which I do, mm. and mm. surrealism, mm. then there's a way in which I see these things as kind of part of absurdism. Mm. Um, because, partly because you, 
you know, we're, we're teasing out the memory, well, the meaning of it, but there's at some level or another, there, there is, there is no meaning because I wasn't there. So mm. there's a sense in which it is absurd mm. in the sense it's kind of the kind of sense you get from nonsense mm. that, that from an Edward Lear poem or a, a Lewis Carroll poem, mm. you know, the owl and the pussycat or the, the jumblies who sail away in a sieve mm. and then come back. So it's a bit like that. Mm. Um, and that's a relief that's because you've put it in a place you've made something and you've got it and it's, it's mm. relieved it yes and one of the interests that we've had over 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 the COVID, over the pandemic that julia and i have had and others as, as well is the fact that many people can do that you know and it's whereas writing poetry may is for some people a profession is 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 complex for practically everybody, they can make these poetic images and metaphors when they're asleep and they make metaphors of their life. And the interesting thing about poems, right, or let's, let's take poems and making a clay pot, you wrestle with the medium. So it's quite mm. easy to think of language as totally transparent, that it isn't a medium. You just talk or you just mm. write. But in fact, it is, it's a medium just as clay is. So you wrestle with the clay to make a pot and then you wrestle with these words. So if I write land of the dead, do I write land of the dead? Do I write Hades? Do I write hell? What do I write? Mm. I decide on land of the dead. Mm. That's, a, that's where I'm wrestling with the words and making them work to do it. And that's a form of objectivizing the subjective because you're putting it into the language that is shared by all mm. other English speakers. Yes. Right. Yes. So you've made it objective and you've given reference points to the Odyssey yes. or whatever in here. Mm. It's just this inchoate stuff that may or may not have words attached. It may do, and it may not mm. be the same words anyway. So you've wrestled with it to make this highly subjective thing more objective more mm. objective mm. and it becomes an object in the sense of a thing in front of you mm. but of course while you're doing it, it's the other sense of object it's your object to write it it's your aim to write it mm. so you've got all that and in the wrestle there is relief because you're working at it am i getting it right am i am i really describing oh, is that am i cheating there am i not being authentic am i being just a bit flippant here I might, I might ask, no, 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 it was like that. All mm. that yes. is like witnessing yourself. Mm. Mm. You know, you witnessed me by reading that back, and that's wonderful. And of course, you, if you can't do it and you're on your own, you can do this thing of writing where you become a witness to yourself. Mm. Yes. And in some respects, the dream does that as well, you know, and it, it, involuntarily as well, which is, yeah. which is the other fascinating thing. It's not, not yeah. done deliberately, uh, usually. I'm just going to turn around and see whether Julia, you're almost ready. Yeah, ready. To... Oh, right. So Julia, in all this time, has been painting. And uh, she's painted uh, the, the dream uh, and she started painting it just as Michael started telling it. So the dream is painted in about 90 minutes and all of our artworks are generally done in about 90 minutes and done from scratch. Uh, and it's been painted onto, as I said earlier, pages taken from Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, just because Freud was interested in working out what the memory sources of dreams were. So mm. we're ignoring the rest of it from Freud and the theory and the wider theories uh, at the moment. It's just painted onto his pages in recognition of the fact that he was a, a wonderful person who got us to think about them. Yeah. And uh, so we are drill, we're drawing onto those. And so I'm going, and so what we're going to do now is what would normally happen is the dream sharer would go over and look at the dream or Julia would bring the dream to the person. But what we've got to do now, because it's a time of COVID and the pandemic, is we're going to show the dream, uh, the painting up on the screen. Am I allowed and to look around And yet? now you can look around. Thank you, Michael. 
Oh, I just caught sight of the word Odin in all that. Yes, yes. Well, that perfect. Yes. Well, we can see the, the Odin, Old English. Yes, the, the Anglo-Saxons are not what well, we don't call them the Anglo-Saxons anymore. So at the top, it says here, um, there, there's the building that you were describing, the 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 ruined um, house. Yeah. The, sorry, the ruined church. Church, and here are the two characters pulling you. And here are your hands being pulled yeah. by them. And here then is the wall. And here are your buttocks yeah. taking central central position here. How nice of them to push my buttocks. Oh no! And That's there's, lovely. There's your wife um, pushing very strongly against you with her foot almost coming oh, over the edge. No. And then the cliff comes up and round and weirdly as we often find in these the word glaucoma is mentioned twice oh my goodness and here it says one eye signifies his one-sided uh, the uh, the elderly man obviously and then here it says i i have amounted to the elements for um the roles of the elderly man which i'd put there and then underneath i'd written uh, i put out here I make sport because I thought in some ways when you were talking, you were talking about making fun of and making sport of things uh, here in the in your in your wife's backside here, it says the woman and um, it also mentions um, rebellious content um, in constructing the comical because I think there's a lot of that in you. Um, also here it says the journey dream, because it is a journey. It's almost like a sort of rebirth, isn't it? Like the birth canal, I thought, coming through this hole. Um, the exuberance of my waking life with individual ramifications. I am a cunning fellow making the dream perfectly, it says there. And so, just a point about Odin, Odin yes. only had one eye. Yes, it says here, he is one eyed like Odin, the father of the gods. Odin's consolation, the consolation in the childish scene, I will buy him a new bed. And it was funny because you were talking about your bed and mm. uh, such like. So those were little things that I found in. Also, the optician is in the sea. And you were talking about the sea. I was trying to get the sea in a particular way. So you can sort of read there. He's one-eyed like Odin. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's my good eye. He's one-eyed like Odin, yeah. There go. There's the eye that I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. I am Odin. All I need now, you know, Odin had a lovely sort of um, bowler hat type thing. It was a kind of strange, wide-brimmed hat. And um, he used to walk about uh, on Earth, and uh, people didn't realise he would encounter people, and he'd be walking along, and then suddenly he'd reveal the one eye, and then people would realise, it's Odin. And Odin lives on as Wednesday. There we are, Woden's day. It's Wednesday. Odin is with us at all times. And um, I've always been rather fond of Odin, Odin um, especially as he's with us on Wednesdays. So yes, he wanders about. Uh, he's, he sometimes accompanies you on a journey, maybe at night, and then you suddenly realise this bloke who's walking alongside you is Odin. Nice. Yes, oh, that's okay. good. Well, I'm, I'm, I am a, yes, there Sorry. you go. <laughs> I, am, I am Odin. Yes. Well, thank you for that painting. Actually, I say that I'm a dibbuk. That's actually what I say. That uh, because I cheated death, I'm in fact a Jewish ghost. And uh, the word dibbuk um, in Yiddish uh, and Hebrew, I think, um, means a ghost. So I do tell people that I am technically a dibbuk. I'm not actually alive. This whole thing you've imagined, and that I'm in fact, you've been listening to a dibbuk. Right. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Michael. Thank you for Julia for. Oh yes, painting. Julia, that's just lovely. Just thank you. And just that's terrifyingly close. That's yes. what's worrying me. <laughs> I looked at that, and my first impression of it was, "Hang on, were you there?" <laughs> yes. Hang on. I don't think you were, Julia. You weren't. No, no. But anyway, that's yes. yes. Even the geography of it is right. Yes. Gosh, gosh. And just to mention that, just to mention that, as in all of our work that i do with julia julia chooses the pages of freud according to the shape of the uh paragraphs on them that will then fit the story of the dream she chooses the pages on that basis so these words which happen to be there are just there by chance 
but during the painting process, Julia finds them. So they are, they're what in art theory terms are found objects. And she incorporates the found objects into the work of art. Yes, and very uh, discreetly, you didn't mention that you'd also isolated urinating, which is good. <laughs> so that's very discreet of you, Julia. But yes, it, of course, in hospital, these things do become your preoccupation. But urinating and pooing and so on, uh, peeing and pooing, they, they, you know, nurse? Uh, no, no, I don't know. Oh, no, actually, I do nurse. So uh, that's very appropriate. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's good. I, I, as I said, at one of the poems is that we are tubes. That's all we are. If you think about it, whether it's nerves or blood vessels or every part of you, bones, it's all we're just we're just a bunch of tubes. That's all we are. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, you become very aware of your tubes when you're in hospital. Yes. So that's great. Yes. So Julia well, found that on the page, but censored it out of the event but it'll be there that on was the very artwork. discreet and kind <laughs> of her it just uh, maybe she was just a bit concerned that i'd be be traumatized in a traumatized way transported back to the hospital like, uh, right well we will get this to michael in, in time we've got a printer who will print it out as an enlarged uh artwork print and so you'll be able to see the words uh, words then. Can we do a high Brilliant. definition scan of that? We've had uh, one person saying brilliant capture of the dream. Another person, great painting and words picked out so relevant. Uh, they are there, as was said, um, the words of Freud that were there by chance. And you Julia's must use that word it. again, palimpsest. Palimpsest yes, and a palimpsest, which is... There you go, you yes. write on there and then you write on top of it and you write on top of it and then you find lovely meanings in the different layers of the palimpsest and maybe our brains are palimpsests as well. Yes, that something else can be written over, over it and yeah. it's, it's using something from previously to, to do a new painting on say for for example yeah well maybe well, we'll, well we print our memories on top of other memories and so there's some way in our heads we're a bit palimpsest like aren't we yes yeah yes oh wow well thank you julia for that painting we got we will we will get that up on on twitter if that's if that's okay oh, yeah, with michael course. very 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 speedily we'll take a a photograph of it so people and then we will do a scan of it uh tomorrow so that will take a bit more time but you'll be able to see the artwork that Julia's produced in about 90 minutes and we thank michael for having the dream we thank michael for having survived and pulled through yes. and thank all the people who were there to help you do so Michael. we thank you for being people. here today for doing all of this we've actually got about seven minutes left and so julia did have a request Oh, gosh. We did wonder if, because we've managed to finish that in time, whether Michael would read the final poem yes. from the book, at the, the, the risk of many of us bursting into tears. But um, because the book is about the value of the NHS and what the health service workers have done for Michael and for all of us, um, Michael had, previous to the pandemic, written a poem about our National Health Service. So, yeah, that's right. So this was for the 60th anniversary. And then I found out that um, this poem was also circulating around hospitals while the pandemic was on. And even in the hospital I was in, it was at the end of my bed. The poem was pinned up at the end of my bed. Um, and occasionally nurses and doctors would say, come up to me and say, well, I've seen your poem and so on, they'd comment on it. So. It somehow or other all connects up and very much connects up with my feelings that all these people, all these hands, all these people had helped me stay alive. These are the hands that touch us first, feel your head, find the pulse and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin. Change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, soothe the saw, burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw out sharps, design the lab. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, 
empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can, clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose, and touch us last. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. Thank you. Thanks for right. having me. And yes. For a, a, a very, uh, how can I put it, archaeological chat that I find sometimes when you start talking about these things, it sort of all sorts of things come up, just like when you're digging in the ground and you, suddenly there was my brother and there was my dad and there was my mum and there was my late son and they were all in this mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. So we were digging down and finding these things. And um, it's just lovely. It's a, it's a wonderful place to be in. Another time we'd be talking about your dream, wouldn't we? We'd have a swap. Yes. Which would be we nice. Could, we we'd could. swap over. I'd yes. sit where you are and I'd say, yes, yes. well, go on then. So what was that? Yes. That yes. would be fairer, wouldn't it? But yes, anyway, you've been very be kind to be the, the listener and prober. Thank you. Yeah, no, our pleasure and honour to have done so, as from Julia to yeah. as well. So thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Michael. We've had a last question in about, yeah. does Michael really think we're just a bunch of tubes? Oh dear, we've had a load of more than I'm sure you're being poet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like biophysics, the idea that we're reduced to tubes. I, of course not. Uh, but I do also like the idea. I don't like the mind body division. We have these two words and we seem to be lumbered with it, that we have a mind and a body and the two things are separate. So I, when I say we're just a bunch of tubes, it's a way of sort of teasing myself um, and imagining that we are just physiological lumps. But um, having spent the whole of my life trying to deal with consciousness in terms of writing and words and jokes and songs and so on. Um, no, I don't think we're a bunch of tubes, but it's quite interesting and difficult to find a way to talk about mind and body all as one thing, because we've got mind, we've got body. I believe it's called Manichaeism, but I can never pronounce it. But anyway, this du dualism and it's a devil. It, it, it causes us so much problem, so much difficulty thinking that we're trapped in this idea that they're two separate mm. things, mm. but they're not, look, it's attached, you know, it's, it's mm. there. Um, I'm sure there must be other cultures that conceive of the mind body. You know, I don't know the words, but we, we need another, I mean, there are words like, I mean, organism, but it sort of, mm. it doesn't cover it, does it? Mm. Anyway, so mind and body. Yes, mind and body. Mm. And we've mind had another body. one which said, thank you, Michael. Great to hear your story and your dream. Glad you have pulled through. Best wishes. Lovely. Thank you. Beautiful exclamation mark. Thank you. Um, absolutely wonderful event. Many thanks. Uh, great painting words picked out as irrelevant. I think I, I did that one. Sisyphus as a metaphor for the absurd condition, of course, cheated death a few times. Yeah, that's, there's a bit of Sisyphus going on. Le mythe de Sisyphe, as um, was it Camus? Yes. Camus, I think, wrote or Sartre. One of them, anyway. Mm. I always yes. forget which. Yes, and we've had a couple of comments to say thank you to Julia for the, for the artwork. So we've had uh, we've had that as well. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Michael. It's uh, we're we're just about on seven o'clock now, so which was the planned time for the end of the event. So I'm really grateful to Michael for coming along, and Michael for telling us his dream, and I'm grateful to all of you for having been in the audience for this and for interacting with this and for listening to the dream and listening to Michael's uh, recollections about his life during the pandemic. And I'm grateful also to Julia as well for doing the painting during, during it. Grateful also to the Freud Museum for hosting this event and for inviting Michael and our, along. And our wonderful crew here. And for, well. I'm grateful also to the wonderful crew who are, yes, thank you, who are behind the equipment and behind the cameras and who have had days of setting things up so that's that's extremely a, a lot of extreme gratitude to you as well 